Well, welcome back to class after third week devotional. It always seems like uh, we've been gone for a long time, but we really haven't. And uh, you might remember that we are in Matthew chapter 19, and that's an important chapter. It covers some doctrinal material that's rather important and uh, often misunderstood today, so we're spending some time combing through that. I do have extra copies of the study sheet if you need one on Matthew 19. Is there anybody who needs a copy of that? I've got plenty. I'll let you search the crowd. Thank you. Anybody else who needs a copy? That's just to give you something to follow along with and kind of figure out where we're at, and it'll touch on many of the things that I'll bring up in class and uh, give you a memory tool to take home with you. I hope you spend some time in Matthew 19. Uh, you'll find that uh, as you travel around the country, you may find different teachings on this subject if it's ever brought up. Uh, this is not a popular topic to talk about. I know I talked to one brother in Christ many years ago and uh, he's rather popular in the brotherhood. And I had some questions about this particular topic, and so I trusted him, and I called him, and I said, uh, can you talk to me about this? And he said, oh, he said, I can, but it's my least favorite thing to talk about. And uh, I said, I understand. It's a tough topic. It touches lives. It touches homes and families. But we need to talk about it, and uh, hopefully... This will be preventative for some, instructive for others, helpful as a tool to talk about with those that you know, and uh, every once in a while the topic comes up. One of the problems that I see with this, we're talking about marriage. We're talking about marriage and uh, what happens if a divorce occurs. And uh, what, what happens if it's not the way God says it should be? The problem with this is it's taught so many different ways in so many different places. One congregation may practice loving discipline to try to save a soul in regard to this particular topic. And what usually happens is whoever it is will travel around until they find another congregation somewhere who teaches it the way they like to hear it and tell them everything's all right and everything's fine. And then they'll just settle in there and be welcomed with open arms. And that's a tragedy. Because I do believe that souls will be lost, and this is one of the ways that they'll be lost. And so uh, we're going to spend some time talking about this, and I invite you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to pick up our topic uh, back in verse 3 and read down through verse 9 and begin our comments again. Remember back in chapter 18 and verse 1 that there was a question by the disciples about who's greatest in the kingdom. And it was a wrong attitude. And Jesus was in chapter 18 changing the attitude and the understanding about that, changing the focus of it. And I think that attitude is still prevalent when we get to chapter 19. Who's the greatest? Who holds the most power? Who has power over another person? And who can bully somebody else into submission? And there's still this attitude that's wrong. And Jesus is again adjusting that attitude. And he's doing it with the Word of God, Scripture. So back in chapter 19, beginning in verse 3, some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him. That means they're dishonest in the way that they come to him. They're testing him. They're trying to entrap him, trying to get him in a corner that he can't get out of and get him into some kind of trouble. So the Pharisees came to Jesus testing him, asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And if you carry a New International Version, it will say something like this. For any and every reason. Can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? Just anything he picks, anything he wants, anything he's dissatisfied with, can he divorce his wife? And that seems to be the sentiment they come with. Verse 4, he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? 
and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh, and what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, Well, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And the reference there is to Deuteronomy chapter 24, about the first four verses. Moses made an allowance because of the hardness of their heart, because they were abusing their wives, because they were sending her away, divorcing her, and then some other fellow would marry her, and then he'd get unhappy, and he'd toss her out, and the first one would take her back again. And Moses <clears throat> made a stipulation about that because of the hardness of their heart. You can't treat her that way. When you send her out, you give her a certificate of divorce, and then you can't take her back. When she marries another man, and if he puts her out, then you can't take her back again. That's an abomination to the Lord. You can't do it. Moses made an allowance there. It wasn't in the law originally, but because of the hardness of their heart, because they were so abusive, because they'd violated God's purpose in marriage and were determined to do that, Moses included a stipulation here by the authority of God about that in Deuteronomy 24. And I want you to notice that Jesus removes it. And he turns marriage back to the Creator's design back in the Garden of Eden. He said to them in verse 8, Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it's not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. We'll have a lot to say about verse 9, but we want to kind of work our way to it. I recommend that you read uh, Mark's account as well with this. In Mark's account, Mark chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, he places this comment uh, about, uh, that would fall in line with uh, about verses 10 through 12 of our text in Matthew. He places that in a more private setting. The disciples come to him in a house, and they ask him about the topic. They ask him more information about it. Mark 10, verses 10 through 12, in the house the disciples began questioning him about this again, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she's committing adultery. So Mark's account doesn't include the exception. Matthew's account does. We need to piece them both together. The acceptive clause is there in the teaching of Jesus, but Mark's account doesn't include it, but Matthew's does. You get a fuller picture by bringing it all together. But in Mark's account, you get the general rule. The general understanding is the situation of everyone who divorces their spouse, whether the wife divorces her husband or the husband divorces his wife, the situation of everyone who divorces their spouse and marries another generally is you're committing adultery. God joined you together, let no man separate, and anybody who does that, you want to divorce your spouse and you want to go be with someone else, that's adultery. That's the general rule. Jesus then adds the acceptive clause in Matthew 19, verse 9, and it changes things with this one exception. But we need to be sure that we understand it. If a man, if a woman divorces their spouse for immorality, they, the one who divorced their spouse for their spouse's immorality, for their spouse's fornication, that one who divorced their spouse because their spouse did that, that one who divorced them can marry again without committing adultery. Now, if you don't have a question in your mind already, you should have. But what about the one who committed adultery? What about that one? Can they marry someone again? And the answer is Jesus doesn't give them permission to do that. The only one given permission in Matthew 19, 9 to marry again is the one who was innocent and divorces the one who is guilty of the immorality. 
that innocent one can marry again. The one who committed the fornication in the marriage, they cannot. There's no authority for them to do that. We have to have authority for all that we do. And someone says, well, yeah, but they divorced them. Well, God didn't give that one permission to marry again. Now, one of the recent objections I've run into, I say recent, I mean in the last 20 years or so, is people looking at Matthew 19 and 9 say, well, there's no guilty party there. There's no guilty party. And I scratch my head and I look at them and I and ask them, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't understand. What do you say? What do you mean there's no guilty party? It's very clearly stating that one commits adultery and the other one does not. One's committed immorality in the marriage and the other one is not. The one who's committed the immorality, the innocent spouse who did not commit adultery, they can divorce the one that did. And the innocent one can marry again. doesn't say anything about the guilty one remarrying. Someone's guilty in that arrangement and someone is not. What do you mean there's no guilty party? And they can't explain it. They just keep repeating the phrase over and over and over again. Well, there's no guilty party there. Explain that. They can't explain it. They just say it over and over and over again as though it's true. What do you mean there's no guilty party? Did somebody commit immorality in that text? Yes. And I finally figured out what they're suggesting. And the suggestion is this. It doesn't matter who committed the immorality in the marriage. If the immorality is committed in the marriage, then the marriage can be dissolved and they each can marry again. That's what they're suggesting. If that makes sense to you, I don't know why. Why, does that, why would that make sense to anybody? Because the idea would be this. Anytime anybody is unhappy in their marriage, all they need to do is go have an affair. Go have sex outside of their marriage. It, do, it doesn't matter who does it. The marriage can then be dissolved and everybody can get married again. So that turns the text this way. Can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? Well, no. He can only divorce his wife if he or she commits adultery. Then they can both be remarried. That's the only reason. Is that a silly loophole? You can't marry someone else unless you fornicate outside of your marriage. Then you can what kind of a loophole would that be? What kind of sense does that make? All right, I'm unhappy with you. I'm so unhappy with you, I'm going to go sleep with someone else. Now I can get out of this marriage. That's ridiculous. Whereas somebody who maintained their integrity and did not commit sexual immorality, they could never get out of the marriage. But if you commit that gross sin, then you can that doesn't make sense with the nature and character of our God. There's nothing about that that makes sense. The only way this text can be understood is if one commits the immorality, the other does not, and the innocent one divorces their spouse. That's the only way that makes any sense. And the only authority to remarry in the text is for the one who did not commit that immorality. When you get all the way through that and you start looking at the response of the disciples, when you start looking at their response to that in verse 10, they said, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. All right, how did they understand it? They were right there when Jesus taught it. How did they understand it? Lenient or strict? They understood it very strict. If that's the case, if that's the way it is with a man and his wife, 
It's just better not to get married. They understood the teaching of Jesus to be very, very strict. And that's not the way people treat it today. People treat it very lenient, easy to get out of the marriage, easy to get married to someone else again. And that's not the way Jesus talked about it. It's good to read carefully the teaching of Jesus. Remember Mark chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, the general rule, anyone who divorces and marries again for some lesser cause than the accepted clause in Matthew 19, 9, they're committing adultery. That's Mark 10, 10 through 12. Anybody who divorces for any other cause, they're committing adultery when they marry again. Matthew 19, 9, the one whose spouse is sexually unfaithful in their marriage can be divorced, and the one divorcing them can marry again without committing adultery. Now I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. We covered this a long time ago, and I don't know if you remember that at this point, but we need to touch on it again. In Matthew 5, verse 32, we're all the way back in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 32, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I want to be sure you understand the way the verb tense is there. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32, this is an aorist tense. It's already done. And it is a passive. This is something he does to her. And the idea is that anyone who divorces his wife for any reason except her unchastity, makes her an adulteress. Passive tense. He has done this to her. Aorist. He's already done it to her. This is not dependent on her future activity. And that's the way most people teach Matthew 5.32. That, okay, he's divorcing her for some other reason than her unchastity. She's not been unfaithful in the marriage. He divorces her. He makes her an adulteress because in the future she's likely going to get married again. And when she does, she's going to become an adulteress because he didn't divorce her for the right reason. That's not what it says. When he divorces her for a reason other than her unchastity, aorist tense, he's already made her an adulteress. Passive tense, he's done it to her. It's not what she's going to do to herself later. It's what he has already done to her. The only reason to divorce your spouse, Matthew 19, 9, is because they've been sexually unfaithful in your marriage. So when he divorces her, he has made her to be an adulteress. That's the impression. That's the implication. I'm divorcing her. There's only one reason to divorce her. She's been sexually unfaithful in our marriage. He's made her an adulteress. The end of Matthew 5.32, whoever marries a divorced woman, one way or the other, whether she is divorced because of her unchastity or whether she's been divorced for a lesser cause, whoever marries the divorced woman commits adultery. The guilty party cannot remarry. The verb tense there is of ultimate importance. And most everybody I've ever talked to has missed that. And it's important to give good attention to the way the text is actually written. We come back to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Whoever divorces, aorist tense, 
the event or act of divorce and marries another, heiress tense, the event or act of remarrying, commits adultery, present tense, hear the tense change, the verb tense changes, that person commits, present tense means, and keeps on committing again and again and again and again and again over and over and over into infinity present tense that person commits and keeps on committing adultery an illicit sexual relationship every time every time there's sexual activity in that new marriage it is committing 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 adultery Adultery is sexual sin. The adultery is not just marrying again. The adultery is committed every time there's a sexual relationship in that new union. They have no right to be together. And they keep on committing adultery. As long as they're in that relationship and performing that activity, they're continuing to commit adultery. And the only way to stop committing that adultery is to get out of that situation, get out of that unlawful marriage, and stop that kind of activity because it will never stop being fornication. And someone makes a plea, well, what if, uh, what if you know, they were in this unlawful marriage and before they ever became Christians? What, what happened? Okay, they didn't even know about this. They, well, one of the interesting things, the way Matthew 19 is written, is that Jesus tells them very clearly, whoever, verse 9, whoever, I don't care if you're a Jew, a Gentile, a Christian, and not, whoever, everybody is accountable to this teaching. Okay, what if it was before they became Christians? Are you, are you suggesting that baptism washes away marriage? No, that doesn't sound right. Because when, when I got baptized, I didn't have to get married again, right? Are we suggesting that baptism turns sin into righteousness? No, that's not right either. If I was a thief and I was stealing... When I'm baptized, it doesn't make stealing lawful. Baptism doesn't make an unlawful marriage a lawful marriage. Baptism is after we've repented of sin. That means there's a change of mind, there's a change of action. We're not doing that sinful thing anymore. And, and sin is still sin. Baptism doesn't change sin into righteousness. It washes away sins that we've committed in the past, but it doesn't allow us to keep on doing the same thing. People will squirm over this teaching because it's hard. And that's exactly the way the disciples heard it when Jesus taught it. If this is the case of a man with his wife, it'd be better just not to get married. This is hard. This is difficult. You could be unhappy for the rest of your life. You could marry someone and find out you're unhappy and miserable and there's no way out of it. Well, it's, it's not about whether you're happy or not. Are you holy? Are you representing God? And what people find out is, and what they will find out if they stick with it, is that the immaturities that make that an unpleasant marriage situation can be overcome and grown in Christ. If they'll put in the time and the love of the Lord, they'll find that to be true. But people will wiggle, squirm, and argue and debate and manipulate Scripture just like the Pharisees were doing. Can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus said, that's not the way it was in the beginning. Haven't you read scripture about that in the Garden of Eden? Well, why did Moses give permission then? Because of your hard, rebellious hearts. Protecting your wives that you were abusing. 
And someone will ask, well, what if your mate's abusive? What if your mate is abusive? What if they're unbearable? I mean, really unbearable in some way. What if they're preventing you from being a Christian? What if that's the case? One of my first questions is, where was your concern about that when you got married? Did you have clues at the wedding altar, before the wedding altar, while you were dating this person? Did you have some clues that they were abusive? Did you have some clues that they were um, a woman chaser or a man chaser, loose morals? Did you have a clue that they were abusing alcohol? Did you have clues before you got married? Well, yeah, but I thought he or she would... Okay. Where was your concern about all this before you said, I do? And then we turn to 1 Corinthians 7, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to put an option on the table. If it's absolutely necessary. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. But to the married... I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. If absolutely necessary, if he's abusive, if you're protecting the children, if he won't allow you to be a Christian, if there's some situation like, and it's absolutely necessary, yeah, you can leave, but you can never marry again. You remain unmarried, or you be reconciled to your spouse, one or the other. You do one or the other. But there's no permission there down the road that you're going to be able to marry somebody else. So when you get lonely and you crave that kind of companionship, be reconciled to your husband, be reconciled to your wife, or remain unmarried. Those are your choices. There's no alternative here that changes Matthew 19.9. Marriage is not a me generation thing. It's it's, it's not doing whatever makes me happy. But I'm not happy. And I know God wants, to, I, He wants me to be happy. He wants you to be holy. You think Jesus was happy going to the cross? Read Hebrews chapter 11 about these great heroes of faith. Some were sawn asunder. Killed for their, do you think that they were happy? They were holy, but they weren't necessarily happy. It wasn't a pleasant circumstance to be faithful. We're not going to be allowed to do everything that makes us happy. Happiness doesn't give permission to disregard the Word of God. And then here's an extreme caution that most people don't note. Suppose someone opts for 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, I, 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 I just can't live for the Lord and be with them. I can't do it, I, and I, I can't stay in this situation, so I'm leaving. All right? What position have you now put your spouse in? What position have you put them in? 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may... Devote yourself to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is your decision. They're not agreeing with it. They're not agreeing to you. This is your decision. You're leaving and you're putting them in a position where you're depriving them from now on. Now Satan's entering in. And so you've left your husband, you've left your wife, and you're determined, I'm going to take this option. I can't be with them, and I, I just can't do it, so I'm going to remain unmarried or be reconciled to them. But wait down through the course of time, and you've put them in this awkward situation. You've thrust this upon them. 
they crave that kind of relationship with someone else and they yield to it. And you say, aha, now they've committed fornication. Now I can marry someone else. No, you can't. You've put them in that situation. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 warns you what's going to happen. But you put them in that situation. And you left your spouse with the decision, I'm going to remain unmarried, knowing you are putting them in this awkward spot. Now you're going to sit back and wait for them to commit fornication with someone and say, aha, I'm innocent. I'm going to get remarried now. That's not the way 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11 read. People have gotten pretty loose with the sanctity of marriage with the permanence of marriage, with the Bible teaching on marriage. God has a design in marriage. And it is supposed to look like Christ and the church. Ephesians 5. That's what it's supposed to look like. Our marriages are supposed to look like God's relationship with us in Christ. And those loopholes I've just discussed, they don't look anything like that. They look like the world. And we need to do some real thinking about marriage and how we teach it. And when those that we love, I, it doesn't matter if it's mom and dad or if it's son or daughter or who it is, best friend, it doesn't matter. And all of a sudden, we start rethinking the teaching on marriage and divorce, and we start creating all these loopholes because we want to hold on to that relationship and act like everything's okay. In other words, I'd rather keep the relationship on earth, disregard what the Bible teaches about it, and if they're lost eternally, I really don't care. I just want to maintain status quo in this world and everything's fine. We need to understand what we're doing when we stand at a wedding altar. And our culture has made everything, including marriage, so disposable, so easy to get rid of. And we have so many of our young people growing up and just opting, I'm, I'm not even going to get married. I'm not even going to get married. Because 50% of all marriages fail, so I'm not even going there. We're just going to live together. Is that somehow better? In, you know, in the old days, we used to call that living in sin. And the reason is it's continual fornication. It'll cost people their souls. It's not better. You haven't avoided anything. I hope that uh, this message gets passed on to younger generations who are thinking about marriage, thinking about growing up, moving out of mom and dad's house and starting life on their own and how they're going to do that because all these things matter. It lays a groundwork for the rest of your life. And it's going to change the way you think about a lot of things. Verse 10, they realized it was very strict. And Jesus said, they said, it's better not to get married. Verse 10, it would be better just not to marry. And Jesus said, verse 11, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. Not everybody can just say, okay, I'm not going to get married. Meaning, I'm never going to have sexual expression. I'm, not, I'm just not going to go there. If that's the case of a man with his wife, if, if marriage is that strict, I'm just not going there. It'd be better not to get married. Jesus said, not everybody can do that. And then he gives an illustration in verse 12. For there are eunuchs who were born. What's a eunuch? What do we mean by eunuch? What, what kind of person are we suggesting here? might be tough for you to figure out how to word that, so I'll help you. Someone living a celibate lifestyle. 
no sexual expression. There are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. Just zero desire there. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs who, were, who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. There are eunuchs who are born that way. Some are made eunuchs by men, anthropos, mankind. They're made that way by mankind. Somebody does that to them, forces it upon them in some way. And there are those who abstain from sexual expression because the kingdom of heaven is more important than marriage that God does not allow. I will understand that I have found myself in this position where God does not give me authority to remarry. And for the kingdom of heaven's sake, I will accept his word and I will live my life in a celibate way to love God and for his kingdom. That's the plea that we need to make to people who find themselves in these awkward situations. What happens more often than not is somebody is in an unlawful marriage and they move from this location to this location over here. And I never knew them when that person was committing adultery. When they were committing adultery, they were unfaithful in their marriage, and, uh, and they got their spouse divorced them because they, they wouldn't repent of it, they wouldn't change. Their spouse divorced them, and now they've married this person. It's not with the authority of God. They're in an unlawful marriage. But I didn't know them when all that was taking place. I only know them today. They moved to our town today. They came to our congregation today, and they seem like a really nice couple. And they got these three little kids. And it's just a precious looking family. And I never knew them when all that was going on. I only know them today. And so we're going to sweep it all under the carpet. That's what usually happens. And that just sweeps souls under the carpet. It gives them a false sense of hope of going to heaven. When in fact they're continuing in sin. This is a very difficult teaching, and I, in preparing for this, didn't expect that everybody was going to agree with it. And I may get some discussion about that later, but that's all right. It is my responsibility to teach you what I have studied and come to understand in the Scriptures. And so I hope it's helpful to you. I hope it will arm you for the future and help you in the present. And uh, we didn't have much time to talk about things. It's 7.59 going on 8 o'clock, and there's not really time to get a question and answer one. So that will give us opportunity next week to open up class and say, what do we have to talk about from last week? And that's the way we'll begin. All right, we are going to dismiss for tonight. Thank you for your good attention.